don't think they'll have a slide down the table because I think there's a lot of quality there and I think um, Errol Bullock do has done a good... Yeah, no, I, do, I really do. Where do you think that squad ranks compared to the rest of the teams around them? Do is you it, think it's a top-half it? squad? I don't think it's a top half squad. I think they are where they where they should be. But we've have seen they got it. a better squad than Middlesbrough. Well, at the moment, I, I probably would say they, they do because. Oh come on! No, 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 no. Defi- Hello and welcome to the Second Tier Podcast. I'm Ryan Dilks and I'm joined by the Mick Beale to my Will Still. It's Justin Peach. Good day to you, Ryan. Justin, how are we? I'm fantastic. I'm gearing up for Christmas. I'm excited. Breaks coming up. Uh, so I, I'm really chuffed to bits. How are you, Ryan? I never ask you. I always say this. And I never ask you. I should be more polite. You should be. And I'm glad that you've actually come to me for once to ask me how I am. I'm good. Thank you, Justin. I uh, I got recognised in a pub yesterday. Well, kind of. Ooh. I um, was queuing at the bar and briefly spoke to a couple of lads next to me. And then I heard one of them say to the other, not very quietly, is that the lad from the Second Tier podcast? And then came the incredibly awkward situation where they're both trying to look at me while not making it obvious <laughs> and at the same time I know that they're looking at me and then the lad closest to me gets his phone out goes on Twitter or X I assume to look at our page and see if it is me and do you know what happened next he says to his mate nah it's not him I was like what <laughs> <laughs> you've just looked at a picture of me how how do you know they were looking for you specifically? What if they were looking for someone like, I don't know, Jake Humphreys? No, because I heard them say second tier podcast. Right, okay. Or maybe they were looking for me. They definitely, well, what, why, would, why would they get me and you mixed up? We look absolutely nothing alike. Yeah, I'm, I'm the more handsome, handsome one, as we as everybody well knows. Um, yeah, you, I mean, you've got a very distinctive beard and, and face. Exactly. So I don't understand how he looked at a picture of me on Twitter and said, oh, no, that's not him. Have you ever been recognised in public before since starting this beloved podcast? No, I think I've got one of those faces that gets lost in a crowd. Not that I'm against that or that's not a sad story for me because I'm so socially awkward. Um, it's a, it's mm-hmm. a good thing. I don't like talking to people. I don't like people talking to me. That's it. So yeah, I think it's a good thing that I'm not I'm not being recognised. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I'd want to put you in a situation where someone who listens to the podcast came up to you and said, oh, I'm such a big fan, because I just don't know how you would respond to that. I think I would start hissing. I would just hiss at them. <laughs> hiss at them and maybe start crying and rocking in a corner. I don't know. It's, it's one that, of those, it could go two ways. That I would like to see. If anyone ever sees Justin Peach in public, and they're not sure it's him, they just want to make sure, say to him, Frank Lampard. And if he replies with the word fraud, then you know it's him. It's just a very easy way of getting around all the awkwardness, I think. Welcome to the number one championship podcast, the second tier. Thank you for joining us wherever you are. Another groundbreaking weekend of championship action for us to get our teeth into. So we'll be doing that very shortly, particularly with the East Anglian derby, which we'll get onto in just a sec. Uh, We'll go through the promotion race, the relegation battle in the second part of the show. We'll also talk about Sunderland's potential new manager, which uh, I'm sure Justin and I have plenty to say about. (laughs) Um, And then we'll finish off with the polls and Simon Grayson take for late right at the end of the show. So in the first East Anglian derby in four years, Ipswich and Norwich drew to all. Three world review from Canaries down under, keeping them waiting. And Reese, who's an Ipswich fan, says, disappointed, comma, bigger picture. A great game this, considering it was the only game on telly on Saturday lunchtime. It was a brilliant advert for the championship, Justin, I thought. Yeah, some beefy challenges, but no yellow cards. Credit to the referee for that. It was end-to-end uh, I don't, as I well. don't know how there were yellow <laughs> no. cards, but Ashley, cards, Ashley but, Barnes certainly deserved at least a couple of yellows. Exactly, exactly. It was, it was um, yeah, an amusing watch. But yeah, credit to the referee, because that's how derby games should be should be officiated. So, so credit there. The atmosphere was fantastic, both pre-game and during the game uh, as well. There was drama. It had everything you want in a, in a, in a local derby, in a football match that you you just don't get in the Barclays, ladies and gentlemen. That's the championship, baby. That is the championship. I loved it. The passion, the atmosphere. It was so end-to-end as well. I would have loved it if that game just went on forever. Uh, but of course, Ipswich haven't beaten Norwich since 2009. And they will be kicking themselves for not winning this. They battered Norwich, particularly in that first half. And they were just their own worst enemy. with not putting chances away, mm. particularly Nathan Broadhead. And... 
it really should have been 3 or 4-1 at half-time. And that will make it all the more bitter a pill to swallow, won't it? That they had such a great chance to end this hoodoo with their neighbours. And they didn't. But as far as this season is concerned, it doesn't really mean much in the grand scheme of things, does it? They've still got a 10-point lead on Leeds and Southampton. Yeah, I think in the grand scheme of things, on the face of it, I think it's a decent draw against a team in uh, with obvious quality in it and are in form. I think what concerns me though is, is is the defensive record. I think in particular the moments in this game just need a, a lot more convincing or uh, need to be a lot more convinced coming away from that from from defensive moments that they just didn't concentrate fully on. The, the first goal, for example, was really poor, uh, and so was the second one. They just need to be better in scenarios. So I don't think in the grand scheme of things. Um, it's bad because I think it's a decent draw, as I say, against a team in form. But bigger picture, as we want to bring in, I think if you continue to defend like that, I think top two is going to be a big, big ask. Really? Even I do. The, I, I, honestly, I think that. Lead, I, Justin. I know it's a big lead, but you've, you, the way they concede goals, I think, is really poor. They've conceded the second most in the, in the current top six now. If you compare it to previous seasons, Burnley conceded 24 at this stage last season. They only conceded 11 more goals between now and the rest of the last season. Uh, Sheffield United, uh, United conceded 19, Fulham 18, Bournemouth 19, Norwich 18, Bournemouth 16, all in the previous three years. So, well, they, they have scored 47, Justin, and at the end of the day, they've had the second point, best points tally ever after 22 yeah. games. And so... With that being said, they've conceded loads of goals already. Mm -hmm. It hasn't really affected them so far. So does it really matter? Well, yeah, because uh, I think you've you've got to be a lot more sustainable. And t the season gets tougher. You know, it doesn't. This isn't a continuation. This is not how the season's going to pan out for the rest of the the campaign. Um, you, you have to tighten up at some point, otherwise you're going to keep dropping points. And and Leeds, I know. Uh, having a bit of a slip of themselves, but they've got the quality to keep going. So to Southampton, who are unbeaten since September. So there are teams there who are, who are looking at you and thinking, you keep slipping up, you keep conceding goals, we're going to keep trying to take advantage of it. Um, so for me, I think, yes, Ips, which have been fantastic so far this season, but if you ignore all the pre-season expectation, if you ignore the record points tally that they've that they've garnered so far, the, the top four now, I think, has, has collected the most points since 1992, which is an incredible feat, and Ipswich have stayed within that. But you have to improve defensively if you want a real, real drive at this top two and, and, and staying within the top two with, with good teams behind you. You have to improve defensively, and I think Ipswich do. Hmm. I'm not sure I agree, but uh, you know Ipswich is still having a great season, aren't they? I will also say the Sky commentator who said Ipswich Town remain in Norwich City's shadow. Not sure how true that is when Ipswich are second, very possibly on their way to the Premier League. Well, Norwich will probably be settling for mid-table obscurity this season, but it's made Norwich fans happy, that quote, <laughs> I suppose. Um, the game is really the start of Ipswich's death run in the Championship. Next up is Leeds away, which is a huge game as far as automatic promotion is concerned. And then we've somehow got an even bigger game, Ipswich v Leicester on Boxing Day. So they say, tis the season to be jolly, Justin, for Ipswich, tis the season to define your season. Uh, I'm not sure how it's transpired that Ipswich will have played Leeds twice before playing Leicester, by the way. That's just my pettiness <laughs> with the football fixture machine, but it doesn't make sense to me. A great result for Norwich, though, Justin. It's worth remembering that Ipswich had won nine out of their ten league games at home this season. So even ignoring the context of the derby, a point at Portman Road yeah. is a brilliant result. And the man at the moment who's written himself into Norwich City folklore is Jonathan Rowe. Scored a brace, and he said before the game, on X... Bring on the fucking derby. And it seems like he meant it. I was going to bring that up as well. It's such a good quote because, you know, he has been a breath of fresh air for this Norwich side. And I think it's a reminder as well of how good the Norwich Academy is. We don't need to go over who's graduated from the from the academy in recent years. But there's been a lot of talented players come through. And John, Jonathan Rose is just the latest. He's got 11 goals for the season now in all competitions, which is an incredible return for a 20-year-old. He's been a bright spark in this Norwich side. And he... And he I'm not going to say he's carried Norwich at times, but they've looked at him quite often to to bail them out. Um, and it's similar in this game. Um, and although his goals weren't sexy against Ipswich, he was in the right place and he was he was persevering and and, and he meant it. You know, shushing the home crowd at Portman Road, being as good as they are at home as well, and must have felt good for a local lad. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure he's been the major positive for them in what's been a very up and down season, but. I uh, well, I mean, he has been the major positive, is what I'm trying to say, but I don't think he's been the best player, um, yeah. because obviously Gabriel Sara may have something to say about that. However, 
Rowe going from a lad who only played three games for Norwich last season, scoring 10 goals at the halfway stage of this season, including two in the derby, it's phenomenal. So for me, when Norwich do this big reset, they should give more academy lads a chance because I agree with you. It's a very good academy there, Justin. Johnny Rowe is a great example of that. Leeds have now failed to win in back-to-back games for the first time since August. South they drew one all at home to Coventry. Jack Dan James nearly won it for Leeds right at the death. Six yards out, one-on-one one with the keeper, but he puts it wide. And that's how close it was for Leeds. A missed opportunity for them to gain ground on Ipswich after they drew earlier in the day. On Leeds in a bit of a slump, Justin. When I say a slump, I mean, of, of course, by the standards they've set yeah. themselves the season, but in their win against Blackburn, it was quite laboured. They were really poor in their loss to Sunderland in midweek and have now drawn to Coventry, which they could have lost, by the way, if Callum O'Hare got his feet in order late on in that game. So, you know, this isn't the Leeds United we saw a month ago, is it, when mm. they were just blowing teams away, is it? No, you are right. It depends how you describe a slump. I wouldn't want to say that they're in a slump because it's only been three games in the space of a week. I'll bear that in mind. It's been three games, but it's been seven days since they're relatively poor display by their usual standards against Blackburn. Um, And I don't think they were poor here against Coventry. I thought they were worthy of the three points based on the chances they created. And I think it's just once again proving to be that they've just been wasteful in front of goal. I saw uh, one of the moments that particularly irked me as Jorginho Ruta was bearing down through the middle of the goal and he he blasts it at the goalkeeper. It was a routine save. It was straight down um, straight down the neck of the keeper, but he, he could have aimed for a corner. It's just moments like that where you really need to, and obviously Dan James one, as you mentioned, moments like that where you really need to be clinical and incisive, and, and they just weren't. And that's what Daniel Farker highlighted post-game. It reminds me a lot of the Bielsa season where they were scintillating going forwards. Their style of play was brilliant, and they created a hell of a lot of chances, which volume of chances-wise got them through the games. So they're just so wasteful and still so wasteful, which is incredible given the amount of talent they've got in the final third. Yeah, well, they st- they struggle to break teams down who sit back against them. That's one problem that they're having. I mean, they did have their chances here, but it seems to me that their results and the teams who sit back with a low block against them, there's kind of a correlation there between the games where Leeds have dropped points. I think tiredness is playing a part too. Daniel Farker has got a, a settled 11 now, which has mm-hmm. started just about every game for a good few months now. And that doesn't really need to be the case. He doesn't need to keep playing the same players over and over again. When you've got the likes of Willie Nonto, Jaden Anthony, Patrick Bamford, Joe Gellard, Charlie Cresswell, Liam Cooper, they've all played fewer than 600 minutes this season. So I think Daniel Farker needs to be braver with resting players, particularly over this Christmas period. But also, you know, things like putting away chances will be a good help as well. And figuring out how to break down teams who do play with a low block against them. You know, that's how you catch up with the likes of Ipswich and Leicester because they've got to, haven't they? So they need to pick up, especially because they've got Ipswich next weekend, which is really transpiring into a season-defining game for both teams, isn't it? Greg's three-word review for Coventry starting to build. It was a great result for Coventry. 11 points from an available 18. When you consider they've played Ipswich, Leeds and Southampton in that time, it's very, very good. And I continue to regard them as someone to keep an eye on. They could be just in the playoff crashes once again. Southampton are now level on points with Leeds after thumping Blackburn 4-0. It's a result which strikes a huge blow on Southampton's chances of finishing fourth this season. A three-word review from Stones. Martin deserves credit. Jake says now 14 unbeaten. It is worth mentioning that Blackburn were down to 10 men for nearly half of the whole of the second half mm-hmm. after Callum Britton got a second yellow for booting the ball away. Why would you do that on a yellow card? It's so daft, isn't it? It's easy to forget, I think, sometimes when you're played. Sometimes you just want to wallop the ball and you can't now. You just can't. Yeah, disgraceful. Um, Southampton were great, though. Should have won it by more if uh, Carlos Alcaraz and his Penenka penalty didn't go over the bar. I've not seen that too often where someone's tried a Penenka and they've skied it over. Uh, He did make up for it later by scoring the fourth goal and then celebrated by saying sorry to the fans. I love that. Um, We could pick out any Southampton player from this performance, Justin, because it was a very good team performance. But the one for me is Stuart Armstrong. He got a goal... But he's someone who I think is very underappreciated outside of Hampshire. Do you agree? No, I do. I do. He's a player that I look to, actually. I think you create a fair bit without getting too much yeah, too much praise. And he was outstanding in this game. And, he, and he's, 
a really good player when he's in full flow. I mean, you just see some of the goals he scores over over the last couple of years. It's been absolutely fantastic. There's one that went viral last week for some reason that was in the Premier League. They had one that had the swizz on it. But he's got that ability to to do that. And again, he took his goal really well in this game. But he's one of those players as well that I'm not entirely sure where his best position is. But he's just mainly a good all round player in the final third. He's, he's active. He's work great matches. His quality. I mean, he won five tackles in this game, which shows how hard he works off of the ball. And he chips in with goals from time to time. Yeah, he's a really important player for Southampton. And again, a player who, as you, as you quite rightly say, is underrated outside of outside of Southampton. The Swiss, the Swiss, the the, the bend. Okay, fine. The bend. Not heard just... that one before. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, I think Armstrong. I think he's one of those who you see him in the Premier League and he kind of fades into the background. It's only when he comes down to the Championship that you appreciate how good a player. He is because he looks a class above. He's kind of like Josh Brownhill, actually, last season because Brownhill in the Premier League, part of the furniture. In the Championship, you're like, wow, he's actually a very, very good player. And Armstrong is just so silky. He's excellent running with the ball, playing that killer pass. He's kind of like a Scottish Iniesta, except he is more than happy to do the dirty work off the ball as well. But yeah, a great player, deserves more recognition in my opinion Justin you're gagging to say something uh, uh, yeah I tried to think of a pun and I, I, I said it in my head and it was it sounded right and then I sort of went for it again it didn't Hagiesta Hagis Hagiesta no no that is yeah that it's terrible isn't it work. that's what I mean you, you no. made me say it you made me say no. it well I'm glad that you've been honest with the group but that just didn't have anything to it at all and um, Michael's three word review worst game under JTD um, technically more than three words, but you can have it. Blackburn have kept up their remarkable record of not drawing games. They've now won nine and lost 11 of their last 20 games. No draws in that time. Justin, you said something in midweek that nearly got past me until I listened back to Thursday's episode. And I clearly wasn't paying attention at the time. You said Blackburn were consistent. They're the definition of inconsistent. Yeah, but I, it, for me, I've split their results in half. It's just half and half. So they've won a lot of games and they've lost a lot of games. That, to me, is consistent. They're either no, winning or they're losing. No, there's, it's consistently inconsistent, <laughs> but it's definitely not consistent. Streaky. It's Lee Johnson levels of, of streaky. They had a similar record last season. It's not, no, Justin, it's not even streaky. It's just you just don't know what's going to happen. It you is win or you Blackburn. Lose. Sometimes they may be good. Sometimes they may be shit. As a great man once said. <laughs> good old Gattuso. Yeah, the, all or nothing is, is the best way to describe them. They give yeah. all or nothing. Yeah. When you say a team is consistent, that means you know what you're going to get from them. You just don't with Blackburn. It's it's quite resource wise. Resource wise. Performances you do know what you're gonna get, I think. You're gonna get carnage. Resource wise, <laughs> you don't know what you're gonna get either. Did you see that Antoine Griezmann revealed this week he's currently playing as Blackburn in football manager? I, I appreciate Antoine Griezmann being one of us. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, a football purist. You know, none of the, not of that FIFA nonsense. Sorry, EA Sports nonsense for the for mm. the kids. He's a, he's a proper proper football man if he's playing FM. And fair enough as well because no disrespect to Blackburn, not a lot of not there's not a lot of interesting uh, things happening at Blackburn to make it a good save this year. No, no, that's FM harsh, talk. Justin. I've played as Blackburn on FM before, and the reason for that is because you want to get a a, a sleeping giant awake again, I think. And that's that's how I feel when I, I take on a club like Blackburn. I, I just think there are sleepier giants on FM to, to take back. No disrespect to Blackburn. I just don't think they're a good FM safe. I think there are sleepier giants. Who's your current FM slave? I did, save it's, even. It's, it's Derby, although I, I, I was offered the job at Bournemouth. I was offered the job at Bournemouth and I um, I, I took it. It's more money, bigger transfer budget. I've gone full Gary Rowett, full, full on snake. I've done it. Sold out his former team. No, Unbelievable. Um, in fifth place is West Brom. It's after they drew 1-0 with Stoke on Sunday afternoon. A bit of a strange game. It felt strangely subdued for some reason. West Brom, the better of the two, maybe did enough to deserve it if it wasn't for Bonham in this Stoke goal having a bit of a blinder. The latest word on the street is that Paul Heckingbottom is the leading candidate to be the new Stoke boss. Reports say the final interviews are taking place this week and it won't be including Nuno Espirito Santo. A lot of Stoke fans were convinced it was going to be him after some made-up rumours were circulating on Twitter or X and it just means Stoke fans are going to be very underwhelmed whoever they're getting now because it's not Nuno Espirito Santo. And the final team making up the top six is Hull City. They're sixth 
after beating Cardiff 3-0. Von Sliders, three-road review. Tigers mauled Bluebirds. And what a free kick by Scott, uh, Scott Twide. He's got three goals in five games now after having a pretty miserable season at Blackburn. Uh, Blackburn. Burnley last season. Ooh. Don't want to get those two mixed up. He just, he just could not stay fit at Burnley last season, could he? And I'm now thoroughly enjoying him playing brilliantly in the Championship. Yeah, he's, he's, he's a talent. And I think he, he's had a slower start than I expected at Hull. But you've got to bear in mind he had a lot of injury problems last season. But he's a magnificent player. He's got three goals now in his last five games as well, which means, well, it shows the indication that his confidence is coming back. And I mean, there's no better way to um, sum that up than the quality on his free kick. He, yeah, he's one of the only footballers, I think, it's kind of going to sound like a big statement in world football who I'm convinced will get a shot on target when the ball is just outside the area for a free kick Ooh. because they it's a very it's a very difficult you know, piece of uh, technique to execute so when when the wall's just 10 yards away and you're 18 20 yards out I think Scott Twine's got a high probability of getting that shot on target well it seems like he's really growing into the season because in the last month he has been superb Susan Perb he has been and his confidence is back and Liam Vazinia deserves a lot of credit for that because you know Twine himself deserves credit too because he could have easily been one of those players who caught the eye in League One but couldn't make the step up to the championship and then his career fades into obscurity but he seems to be getting better and better and that is very exciting for Hull and they're just ticking over nicely aren't they there hasn't been a mad run of form over the first 22 games of the season or anything like that they've just been solid all season been in the top half since game two they've won two from two without their star man Jaden Philogene as well it's enormously impressive and to mark how impressive they've been Liam Rosinia has been given a new three-year contract and I think that's very well deserved Justin it is I mean you only want to look around look at the turnaround they've done uh, they've had under under Rosinia he fully deserves it he's, he's not only transformed how Hull play the, the confidence in how they play, their results as well. And he's nurturing a squad that was so, you know, everyone forgets this, so, so haphazardly put together last summer, rightly or wrongly. Um, but he, he's nurtured that squad as well and he, he deserves it. I think he's also the only manager in the league who you'd happily bring home to meet your parents. He's just such a nice human being, lovely smile, dresses well. For me, the rest of the managers in the Championship are, are so-so. I'm trying to think of other managers who I would, if I was a parent... Who would I like my daughter to bring home? I think yeah. Zinia might be up there, actually. Yeah, I think you might be right. Um, definitely not Ainsworth. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we don't manage it anymore. Is it? No, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> another dig. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't help myself. Just um, yeah, Rosinia. I think the thing that you have got to remember is, as you rightly say, the squad from last season was put together rather hurriedly. Um, but at the time. Hull were 21st on the edge of the relegation zone in a relegation battle. Serious danger of going down. Ended up finishing the season very comfortably in mid-table. And now they are sixth. Mm -hmm. and that is a really brilliant turnaround in just over a year. He's only yeah. been there for, what, 13 months. Yeah. So that's an incredible turnaround from Mazzinia. He's one of those managers who I think has a lot of potential. Um, speaks really well in the media as well. I'm a big, big fan of Liam Mazzinia and a big fan of what he's doing at Hull. Three word review from Cardiff fan Andrew. It's been coming and Rich says pour all over. Uh, we haven't spoken much about Cardiff recently, Justin. It's now five losses from seven for them. They had a promising spell where they won four games on the trot, but they seem as if they're fading mm -hmm. and I think they could have a bit of a slide down the table. I wouldn't. I, I don't think they'll have a slide down the table because I think there's a lot of quality there, and I think um, Errol Bullock do has done a. Yeah, no, I, do, I really do. I think Errol Bullock has done a good job as well. Um, but what, the attack needs to improve. Let me pull you up on that. What quality do you think they've got? What? What? Sorry. What? Where's the quality? Where's the quality? Yeah. Um, well, you've got uh, Gautas at centre half, for example. He's a very, very good player. Perry NG has been one of the most consistent fullbacks in the league this season. Jamila Collins, as well, has also been a very productive wing back this season. I think in midfield, they there are some improvements, but Joe Rawls has, has, has stepped up, and obviously, if Aaron Ramsey gets fit and comes back into the side, there's a lot of quality there um, in his output. We that we we know yes, he showed when he was fit. Fine, fine. You're naming players. Yes. Yeah, in I'm naming terms players. Of, but... In terms of quality, though, where do you think? that squad ranks compared to the rest of the teams around them. Well, how are you defining quality? Is it? Is Do you think it, it's a top-half squad? 
I don't think it's a top half squad. I think they are where they where they should be. They're a mid table. They are twelfth at the moment, and that's probably where they where they should be. I think they are better than sides that are, are, are below them. Uh, sorry, yeah, they're better than the likes of Plymouth, Birmingham, um, Millwall. And I think Bullets done a decent think it's job. Than Millwall. Yeah, I, I I do think sure it's better than Millwall. I think what we've seen with Millwall now is a lot of there's a lot of holes in it, and yeah, we could go into that on another day. But for me, I think. The, the issue with Cardiff is that the attacking uh, from attacking sense are not good enough. They, if you, I don't want to run stats too much, but to paint a picture and provide a little bit of context to the, to the debate, they've not posted a high, higher XG than their opponent uh, opponent since the Preston win in November. Um, so defensively, yeah, sure they they can still improve, but from an attacking point of view, they've been really really poor. Yeah, well, I mean they've been particularly poor recently, but they have not been playing well since their those four wins that they got in a row and they have been in the top half for most of the season but the underlying data has them down as a bottom half side they've done well to concede so few goals but going forwards that is where the problems largely lie for me they've got a lot of players who can be good but we don't see it often enough so they're a club eagerly waiting for January to come so they can sign players but even then I don't think that's a guarantee that they'll improve because they signed nine players in the summer but how many of them were good signings. Gautas at, at the back, definitely. Siopis, yes, in midfield. The rest of them, very hit and miss. So that's why I think they'll continue to slide. I don't agree with you. I don't think their squad is a mid-table one. I think it's bottom half at best. I don't think they'll be in a relegation battle or anything like that. I, but I struggle to see them sticking around in the top half or near the top half, for that matter. No, I don't... I don't... I... <laughs> I disagree to an extent because I do think there's, there's quality there. Um, I do honestly do but think there's quality. That's a very there's blanket lot, then, statement, Justin. That's a very blanket statement. It is a blanket statement, um, but we've Have seen. They got it. a better squad than Middlesbrough. I don't think. Well, at the moment, I, I probably would say they, they do because. Oh come on! Justin. No, no, no! You, you had them to finish look at, in the top two at the start of the season. <laughs> Yeah, but just look at the injuries that Middlesbrough have got. If you're telling me, ask me right now at this point in time, Cardiff have got a deeper squad with a lot more quality in depth than, than Middlesbrough do because half Middlesbrough squad is injured simple as that I don't think they've got a better squad overall but Middlesbrough can only field half half a squad at the moment it's as simple as that for me I think Cardiff have got a lot of quality and a lot of potential that they can get out of players I mean Yaku Mate's they got composed. better squads than Bristol City I don't think they do Coventry um, again no. you're just blanketly naming teams um, yeah, but and it's not all about. But it's not all about well, the quality. It of the seems squad, like you, you think they're they, they're about twelfth in terms of how good their squad is, but you seem to be naming a lot of teams who don't have who do. Yeah, have but there are teams Cardiff, that are so. uh, the, the likes of Norwich and, and Preston, I think, who are above them, who I think probably should be lower down in terms of the quality of their squad. You think the squad's better than Norwich's, with the exception to one or two individuals. I think overall, I think it's better. Yeah, <sighs> I'm not sure about that. Not sure at all. Anyway, we'll end that there, Justin, and we'll have a break. After that, we'll discuss the relegation battle and Sunderland's incoming manager. Welcome back to the Second Tier Podcast. Let's have a look at the relegation battle then, and it's been made all the more interesting by Sheffield Wednesday, who have won three from four games after coming from a goal down to beat QPR 2-1. Jassim's three-word review... We're staying up. And Anthony Masaba has now scored two injury time winners in the space of a week. And the scenes for this one were brilliant. We said not too long ago, Justin, that Wednesday was showing a bit of life. Now they're alive and kicking. Just over two weeks ago, they were 12 points from safety. It's now just six points from safety. And we are witnessing the resurrection of Sheffield Wednesday, Justin. And I'm here for it. It's huge. I've seen, so I mean, I'd bring it down a little bit as well. I've seen a few people on socials taking the piss, unfairly in my opinion, saying that Wednesday is celebrating going from 23rd to 23rd. But the shift in the momentum of that club is so big, you cannot understate how important that is and how and how much of an impact it can have on you pushing yourself out of the relegation zone. Yes, Wednesday have what, right now, six point gap between them and Huddersfield in 22nd. I don't think that's a lot at this stage of this season. Um, and, and you've got to compare it to where they were. They were genuinely pu uh, pushing to set the lowest points record in the championship history. They were so bad. The club was on its knees, still is on its knees in some aspects, but Danny Royal has come in, picked it up by the scruff of the neck and pulled it along with him. And I'm here for it. He's, he's done absolutely fantastically well. 
Um, and he's put the energy back into Hillsborough. I love it. They're on one knee, aren't they? But that's because they were on their knees before. They've put they've put their foot down, <laughs> lifted that one knee, and that's because they're readying to stand Describing up, movement. aren't they? Describing movement. <laughs> Describing a, a person going from two knees to, to standing one. up. Drama. Yes. That's what we do on this podcast. We describe a slight movement as a as a as a metaphor for a club going in the but right direction. That, that Justin is exactly what they're doing because they looked dead and buried, didn't they? I don't yeah. think we're being overdramatic in saying that, even though it was so early on in the season. It was the worst start in Championship history, and even when Danny Royal came in, we were saying, you know, maybe he'll be a good manager in League One. But now look at them, and they didn't look like winning before let alone three wins in four games. So to turn it around in such a short space of time is absolutely ridiculous. And they've got a genuinely good chance of staying up. Yeah, yeah, I, I wouldn't rule them out. I definitely wouldn't rule them out because Danny Rose done a fantastic job. And when you hit form at this point in the season, just before January, I think that the mood completely shifts. Your type of players that you can potentially get in completely shifts as well. Um, and Danny Rule's doing this with Isco Munoz's squad, by the way, and, and Darren Moore's squad. He's not doing it with his own players. He's yeah. he's had to make do with what he's had. I'm not sure what this says about Isco Munoz as a manager, how Danny Rule's doing now, yeah. but uh, we'll leave that one there. Yeah, the, the, yeah. the quicker we move on from Isco Munoz, the better. We can say a lot on him. Um, but again, the two late winners in the space of a week just tells you the belief in the squad is, is, is completely shot up as well. And for me, if he keeps... Wednesday up um, in the championship this season. He's my manager of the season, without a doubt. Rock, rock and roll. Bigger than Kieran McKenna. Yeah, 100%. I'm not sure 100%. about that. One million percent. I, well, it'll be close. It'll be very close. We'll just we'll have that discussion at a later date if, mm-hmm. it, if we ever actually come to that bridge. But I mean, Wednesday's chances of staying up will depend on what they do in January. Who knows how much they'll have to spend, particularly with De Chancery seemingly changing his mind on a weekly basis with regards to funding the club. But Danny Rawl has given the fans belief again. When there wasn't much to be found before, and if he keeps them up, then everywhere he goes, they'll be rolling out the red carpet for him. And Justin Peach enjoyed that one, don't don't look at the face that he's pulling. A 96th minute penalty from Delano Bergzorg saw Huddersfield draw one all away at Millwall. Millwall fan Harry's three-wheeled review should have held on. Al says same old shit. Lord Levitz, a Huddersfield fan, he says papered over the cracks. Not three words, but, you know, we'll let you off with the extra word on this occasion. Um Huddersfield keeping up their impressive record of just drawing all the time. They've now drawn nine of their last 16 games. A good result in that case, I suppose. They remain 21st, two points ahead of the relegation zone. And I feel like someone struggles we haven't spoken enough about recently, just in a Millwall. Mm-hmm. Just one win in 12, the 18th, just two points above the bottom three. It's not been good, has it? I say 18th, actually, they're 20th. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's it's quite interesting because they got them and Stoke sitting just or nervously above the the relegation zone. You got QPR on Wednesday hitting form while while those two teams are struggling. Yeah, it, it is bad. It's 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 a concern. They're playing with a lot of nervousness at the moment, which is which is interesting because they always always under Gary Rowett always came across as a team who were comfortable just being uncomfortable if that makes sense you know they're happy to defend they were they were organized they, yeah, there was a lot of assurance there whereas now there's a lot of you know, a lack of assurance there's clean sheets have become harder to come by um and at the moment there just feels like there's too many mistakes being made within the team they didn't for example didn't need to give the set piece away that led to the penalty for example it was a it was a you know a bad moment um but sometimes the price of progress is to take two steps back so hopefully edwards can get his team going but two steps back is that a trip into League One you should hope not because Millwall have been a team knocking on the top six for a long time now and that looks a very very long time ago yeah well defensively they haven't been at the standard of which we expect Millwall teams to be at have they but I don't think individuals have been playing very well Zion Fleming was excellent last season but hasn't matched those standards this season I was worried about whether last season was a bit of a flash in the pan for Tom Bradshaw, and it seems to be the case. He's only got two goals to his name this season, and Kevin Nisbet is essentially a Scottish Tom Bradshaw. So he doesn't really <laughs> offer much else to what Tom Bradshaw already offers. Right. And they've been missing Casper Denora through injury recently, which hasn't helped either because he's been probably the biggest bright spark of their season so far. So it's not been great. And no team has won fewer points than them since Gary Rowett got sacked. So 
you look at it in comparison to our preseason predictions, they're arguably the biggest underachievers mm-hmm. of the season so far. And I think Joe Edwards deserves time because it's his first job in management. And I'd be surprised if we got to a stage where they were in genuine danger of going down. However, this Millwall squad is a talented one in my eyes. It should be nowhere near 20th in the table. Really should be in the top half because it's not completely different to the team that only just missed out on the playoffs last mm-hmm. season. So why have we had this big drop off? I don't really know it's quite difficult to put your finger on one specific thing into a 95th minute winner from Morgan Whitaker saw Plymouth beat Rotherham 3-2 Andrews three road review injury time madness it's worth saying Rotherham were down to 10 men for most of the second half after Daniel Ayala got sent off again for another stupid second yellow card it's happened in successive games now this time it was a handball when he just decided to do like a volleyball spike didn't he when the ball was being played over the top the ball wasn't even going to run through to a player. Yeah, sure, there was space in behind, but there was covering players and there's an extra 40 yards for the Plymouth player to get into. Honestly, the thickest moment I've seen from a footballer this season. The <laughs> second thicker, thickest. Well, I was one of say. the thickest. Yeah, Danny Lyle is <laughs> top of that list. <laughs> is, it, is it thicker than the one from the last game he played? Uh, it edges it because this was a handball. Um, so, yeah, he's, he's, um, <laughs> he's chipping away at the old thickness, isn't he? Yeah. He's an experienced pro. Stop being so daft, Daniel. Uh, But great scenes here with the late winner. And Plymouth are now up to 16th with this win. Let's throw some praise at Stephen Schumacher, Justin, because we've spoken extensively about Plymouth's brilliant recruitment, but they still need someone to knit that all together. And for them to now be sat 16th in the table at the halfway stage nearly of the season, he is doing excellently, isn't he? It's not a surprise, really. He's, he's, he's a fantastic coach, and he's, he's turned this team from his side into such a good attacking outfit that I'm sure if you put him or gave him an extra ten million pounds to spend, Plymouth would quite easily be a playoff contender. I know that's a really unrealistic and, and, and blanket statement to make, mm. but he's got that ability to adapt his team. You look at him this season; he's changed formations. They obviously we know Plymouth recruit really well, but the players that he's got at his disposal on a small squad as well, it's worth bearing in mind. He's getting a lot out of them. Yeah, you've only got to look at Finn Azaz, who was excellent for Plymouth last season, came in a little bit later on loan again this season from Villa. But the composure he's got in that final third, his assist for the Morgan Whitaker win, it was, was absolutely fantastic. He just knows how to get the best out of the individuals within the team that he's got. And I think you've got all the ingredients there for him to be a top, top coach at, uh, um, well, at, at championship level at the very least. Um, it just depends how, how he can get there, whether that's with Plymouth or, or, or somebody else. Well, I've seen him linked with the Stoke job, and I'm just looking at that thinking, no, why? Don't do it. Why would you bother? Don't do it. <laughs> you may get paid more, but Plymouth is a club massively on the up. I can, yeah. I can almost guarantee they will be in the Premier League before Stoke are with the way things are going. So stick around, Stephen. And it's just a brilliantly run club with loads of exciting players, loads of exciting young players as well. It must be one of the youngest squads in the division, if not the youngest. And as you say, it's quite a small one as well. So Stephen Schumacher is getting them all to play at a new level. He is doing a top job down at Plymouth. Lee Manning got just his second win as Bristol City manager. They beat Sunderland 1-0 thanks to a Tommy Conway penalty. Bristol City have played quite well recently, but not got results. They didn't play well here and got a win. So that just sums up the championship in a nutshell, doesn't it? But a big win for Liam Manning. This was, uh, there was a growing sense of trepidation from Mm -hmm. Bristol City fans after a slowish start to his reign. So this eases that at the very least. Matthews, three-word review for Sunderland. Please not Beal. Um, Sunderland, of course, managerless, but it looks as if that's going to be changing soon because... Numerous reports say they found their new head coach, former QPR and Rangers manager Mick Beale. Justin, how are you feeling about that? Fuck that guy. (laughs) Mick Beale, my goodness. You're still you're still very bitter about the whole QPR departure, aren't you? Absolutely, and I've got a a, you know some good not good good uh, context for it, but a a good way of angling the argument on Mick Beale. But I first want to make the statement that he. Did a really good job at Rangers uh, at making them look the third best team in Scotland while decimating the squad. It's worth pointing out. You're being genuine for a second. No, I'm not. (laughs) He's... Yeah. (laughs) Try not to fill this segment up with swear words. Um, 
Of all the candidates available to Sunderland, including Tony Mowbray, I know he's not a candidate, but we'll bring him into the argument, Mick Beal is the last one I had a point. <laughs> Aside from the 15 games that he had at QPR and a very underwhelming spell with Rangers, we do not have a big enough data pool to judge him on. And that's why being a slippery little snake works against him in my book. I don't like how he left QPR. I think it was... I, I can't believe he's getting another job in the Championship nearly a year after that happened, by the way. But just how he left QPR and the the, the, the limited uh, number of games in which we can judge him on as a manager. I have no idea how he's getting this job. No idea. I'm not sure how they've gone from Will Still to Mick mm. Beal. It's... Oh. Like your boss saying he's going to take you out for a Michelin star meal and you end up in Greg's. It's it's very underwhelming. And it seemed to me like the whole reason why they sacked Tony Mowbray, who was doing a good job, was because they thought they could do better and really go for promotion. Is Mick Beale an upgrade? I, I don't think he's no. a terrible manager. He did quite well at QPR initially, but Rangers was a disaster. And I just cannot see what Sunderland's seeing him. It doesn't make any sense. The, the candidates that I've seen Sunderland link with, um, that I have done some research upon, uh, I, I like how they set up their teams and I think it works really well with Sunderland. I know I can say that because of not being appointed, but just read up on them and if you can make that comparison yourselves. Mick Beal for me, I just, again, the limited number of games we had at QPR, yes, Chris Willock was, was, was doing really well, but they were outperforming their XG so they weren't creating a, an abundance of chances Chris Willock was an XG buster for a good four or five games with some screamers and and they were moving in um, the right direction slowly but again 15 games it's, it's just not enough to, for him to get a job at a club who um, are moving in, a dire- in, the, in the direction of the Premier League I, I think this is such a backwards appointment for, from a Sunderland point of view um, and yeah quite rightly underwhelmed yeah, Sunderland are an ambitious club looking to get back to the Premier League as soon as possible. If Stoke or Swansea appointed Mick Beal, I'd be feeling discouraged. And they're mid-table championship clubs. Yeah. So he must have done wild hell of an interview for the job because I really don't understand this at all. Quite an eye-catching result from the weekend. Preston won Watford 5. Adams, a three-word review, on the march. And James says, Ishmael is goated. Ollie says, playoff contenders. And it's incredible that the only team to win a game by four or more goals on three or more occasions this season is Watford. I've said it before, but they're a very strange team. However, credit where credit's due, they were very good here. They're only five points off the top six, Justin. Do you think they could be a dark hornet for the playoffs? <laughs> dark hornet. Um, oh, it's hard to say from a results and performance perspective. Uh, I want to say yes because I like Ishmael, and I did make that bold prediction at the start of the season that he will, he will um, end the season as manager of Watford. Um, but they can be so volatile. That being said, just looking at the record now, they are they are ninth. They've got a plus eight goal difference, only five points off the top six. Um, they've got January coming up as well. Ishmael Coney's looking extremely good, um, maybe lacking a consistent goal scorer. Defensively, they're good. They've got some nice ingredients. It's just whether or not they can um, find a goal scorer that gets them into the top six, and that's going to be the difference for Watford. I don't think if they if they miss out on a striker in January, I think they might struggle to get into the top six. Yeah, I'm extremely wary of us talking about teams who are in the top half of the table and saying they're a contender for the playoff because I don't want to look at every team who's in the top half of them. Mm-hmm championship and say oh yeah they're a contender for the playoffs they're a contender for the playoffs because I don't think I think it'll get a bit tiring if we repeatedly say to listeners yes they have got a genuinely good chance of getting into the playoffs so with Watford I think defensively they're brilliant I think they're one of the best teams in the division defensively Um, Hoyt and Porteous two very very good defenders going forwards I think they are much more of a mid-table side. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah, Watford are in the top half. So I guess they are, by default, a playoff contender. I think there's quite a few teams ahead of them, though, in terms of actually getting into the playoffs. Because ultimately, as we keep saying, there's basically four of the top six taken up already by the current top four. So you've got two spots yeah. available. And... That's why I 
be quite surprised if Watford actually did get into the playoffs. And also, if there are two clubs in this division that shoot themselves in the foot quite regularly, one of them is Stoke and the other is Watford. So there's quite Watford, a few in that category and Watford are definitely in there. But Watford, yeah, do it on the reg. So if that if they're in three points off the top six come uh, come March, wouldn't be surprised if Ishmael got sacked because the Watford aren't in the top six. They're that sort of club who can make that sort of decision to really scupper their own chances. So yeah, they it, it's in Watford's hands, I think I would say. I know it's a very easy statement to make, but Watford are the team, they're, they're their own worst enemy is the easiest way to summarise it. Yeah, and we like to think they've turned a corner with regards to hiring and firing managers, but we thought that last season, and look how it went. <laughs> uh, Daniel's three-word review for Preston. Ryan Lowe out. It's just three wins in 15 for Ryan Lowe's Preston. Quite the contrast there. Brilliant start to the season where they won six on the bounce, isn't he? And he's a man under pressure, isn't mm-hmm. he? Do you think he's right to be under pressure? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, I've praised him and I've rated him very highly, but this run of form, and more worryingly, the, the amount of goals they're conceding are a real real worry they don't they don't create enough chances i've said it before this season they don't have enough create uh, creativity within the side and we're seeing that now um and when you don't have a lot of creativity in your side you better be sure to be good at keeping clean sheets and they're just not um i did see a plymouth fan suggest on on social that uh, ryan Lowe cannot manage teams through winter which made me think a little bit is he a fair weather manager they lost 11 in 17 between october is he He's hibernating? <laughs> is it, Ryan Lowe is a fox. Yeah, they lost 11 in 17 between October and March last season, for example. So I think the best summary you can give them is put Preston in southern Spain and they might win the Champions League. <laughs> it's a very good point. <laughs> if Ryan Lowe fancies a, a career in management afterwards, then I'm sure there'll be jobs in Brazil where he would be winning the Copa Libertadores every single season. <laughs> um, but the drop off at both ends of the pitch is concerning. Since they lost 4 0 at home to West Brom at the end of September, they've conceded the most goals in the division. They've won 12 points from an available 42, and only Millwall and Rotherham have won fewer in that time. Look, I like Ryan Lowe. I think he's a good coach, but it's clearly not going very well. And in previous seasons, you could have blamed the squad for not having enough money spent on it and them not being his players. But they spent a decent amount of money in the summer by Preston standards. And one of the players they spent a fair bit on in Mads Frockyar Jensen is barely playing. Mm-hmm. So something's got to change. Is the answer to sack Ryan Lowe? I don't know. I'm, um, I am still a believer in Ryan Lowe. However, you look at how things have been in recent weeks, it's uh, it's it's only seemingly getting worse. And that's concerning for Preston. Middlesbrough got back to winning ways with a 2-1 win away at Swansea. Indirect free kick alert. We saw one of the best sights in football. <laughs> Middlesbrough getting an indirect free kick after Swansea goalkeeper Carl Rushworth picked up a back pass. Middlesbrough scored from it and... Uh, we just need to see more of them, really, don't mm-hmm. we? It doesn't happen enough for my liking because it's just pure carnage, isn't it? Yeah, Morgan Rogers getting an assist for the goal as well is even more incredible. He just <laughs> touched the ball. <laughs> he basically scraped it with his studs and that's an assist, apparently. Uh, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Borough ending a three-game losing streak with this result. Three-word review from Reese Need a manager. Uh, that's re- with regards to Swansea, of course, who... Are still managerless. We now know their new boss won't be Chris Davies. He's said to have rejected the job to stay on as Spurs assistant coach. If reports are to be believed, Swansea seemed quite fixed on him. So not sure where they'll be going next after that. The final game of the weekend is Wagatha Christie Part 2. It's Vardy v Rooney in Birmingham v Leicester. That's on Monday night. We'll be doing a special reaction episode to that game on Tuesday. So make sure you listen to that for reaction to that game. Now let's do the polls, Justin. This is the part of the show where we give the listeners three questions on Twitter. So we want to get their thoughts on everything to do with the championship. So the first question we asked was this. What colour is East Anglia? Blue or yellow? What does that mean? It's like, you know, when it's the Manchester derby and they'll say, oh, Manchester is blue. Manchester is red. Oh, right. Okay. What colour is East Anglia? What colours do you make when you mix blue and yellow? Don't know. I'm colour blind, mate. Yeah, I'm asking the wrong person here. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, my strong point. I guess it's. I guess it's. I guess it's a green. It's somewhere in between. That's still Norwich, though. 
there, there you go. It's Norwich. Wow, it's the okay. colour of Norwich. I, I'm not sure I agree <laughs> because, well, it, it depends. Does do, does the colour of the of the area change whenever a derby game happens? Because if you based it on how each team is doing at the moment, it's very much blue, isn't it? I guess so, but it's it's more so the it's it's an individual accolade. It's an accolade only for those two clubs, and everything else around it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's which win the Champions League. If Norwich beat them, Anglia is yellow. Yeah, but say for example, Bristol City and Bristol Rovers. If Bristol Rovers last beat Bristol City most recently, the mm. last time the two teams played, I don't know what the most recent result was, then. That would mean Bristol is blue, even Absolutely. though Bristol City have been ahead of Bristol Rovers for quite some time. Yeah, Bristol Bristol is blue. I, I, I'm actually all for that argument and, and that debate. Whoever I'm wins not, last... I'm not sure that checks out. No, no. Whoever I'm wins last... I'm not sure Bristol City fans will agree with you either. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Whoever wins last, that's the colour of your area. All right, then. Um, well, according to our listeners, East Anglia is blue. 56% of people agree with that. 44% of people say it's yellow. Who would you prefer as manager, Mick Beale or Tony Mowbray? Tony Mowbray. I would also choose Tony Mowbray. 79% of people wow. agree with that. 21% said Mick Beale. And finally, choose your fighter. Celebrations, heroes, quality street, roses. Celebrations all day. Heroes really? next. Really? Yeah. Are you serious? I think celebrations are a bit overrated, to be honest. <sighs> Why? I just think like I've had I've had them enough times now, and I'm, I'm over it. Christmas chocolate doesn't change, Ryan. It's it's the same four. It's the same. It's like it's like the Premier League. This is why we made a Championship podcast. We should now make a Christmas chocolate. We should enter that market. The reason why we made a Championship podcast was because the Big Four dominated, and therefore everyone's conversating, uh, conversing over the Big Four, i.e., celebrations. Manchester City, blah, blah, blah. I have no idea what you're talking about. Neither right do now. I. But the, the only thing, the point I'm trying to make is that celebrations, you've got half the chocolates in there, which are pretty bang average, especially Bounty, which is by far the worst. Oh, you're a um, Whereas Quality Street, for example, I'll have all of them. You have the toffee pennies. Oh, yeah. You are an absolute scumbag. And plus, I think Quality Street's just better quality as well hence the name no 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 quality also, street. heroes heroes very good uh, very good selection tins as well yeah heroes are great quality street remind me of the 50s don't know wow. that's that's a disgraceful opinion and um, 38 percent of people said celebrations 36 percent said heroes 17 percent said quality street it's heroes or quality street for me if you're going to get me a big brand then go for heroes, but I will never turn down a quality street. I'll be there all day. 9% of people said roses. Yeah, fuck roses. Now it's time for this. Hi, Simon Grayson here. Yes, it's time for Simon Grayson's Hateful Eight. So I'm going to ask Justin to name eight of a certain subject. All he's got to do is name all eight. So, for example, if I would say name Steve Bruce's last eight clubs and he would say Villa, that's one down. And then Newcastle, that's another down. But if Justin were to then say Weymouth, he would lose a life. So all he needs to do is give me all eight answers without losing all his lives. And you can get involved in the fun by sending in your Hateful Eights for either just a night to answer. Send them into secondtierpod at gmail.com. And you can get a shout out the next time we do a Hateful Eight. Alternatively, just play along at home let us know how many you get this week's hateful eight is from neil greer and he wants you justin to name the last eight teams to be promoted to the championship as winners of league one any team who's won it more than once will only count as one answer i'm going to give you two lives on this peachy what is your first answer that's a really good one well done neil um yeah good on you neil i'll go with plymouth first Plymouth are correct. They won League One last season with the second best points tally in League One history. That's one down, Justin. Oh, did Rotherham win it the year before? I'll say Rotherham because I think they must have won it at least once over the few yo-yo spells they've had. Rotherham haven't. They Shit. have always either just won the playoffs or come second. Justin Peach has lost a life already. Oh dear, oh dear. Justin, you've got one life remaining. You've got one down. <laughs> Shit. Oh, we're in trouble here. Um, uh, no, my mind's gone blank now. I will throw Coventry in because they won it the uh, 
the uh, football was canned slightly early. They did. You're right. For a moment, he looked a bit concerned there, Justin. Um, yeah, they won it in 2020 when the season was curtailed because of the pandemic, but the title was awarded to them. That is another down, two down, one life left. Tony Mowbray won it with Blackburn. No, they didn't. They came second. You're oh, taking the no. piss. Shit, I'm no. so confident. <laughs> I think they came second to Wigan, didn't they? Oh, oh dear. You know what? I'll give you another life because this has been particularly embarrassing. Yeah. Um, oh dear, Justin. You, so you've got an extra life. You, you've done a Sonic and found an extra life behind a, <laughs> behind a, a ring um, or something. No, like I'll that. take I'll take the L, but I'll name the rest of the teams. I'll go with Hull City. I think they won it under Grant McCann. Well, yeah, they finished second behind Bolton. <laughs> <laughs> they won it in 2021 <laughs> under Grant McCann. That is correct. So. That's three down, five to go, one life remaining, Justin. Um, crikey me. I mean, he said Wigan. So clearly Wigan won it. Oh, shit. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they won it three times in the past eight seasons. 2022, 2018 and 2016. Um so that is correct. That means you're halfway there, Justin. You've named the four most recent winners of League One. I mean... That's not a word. Um, Do you want a clue? No, no, no. Bristol City, they won it under Steve Cotterill, but I don't know if that's within the time frame. It is within the time frame, actually. They won it in 2015 with Steve Cotterill in charge. They're the seventh most recent on this list. Um, three remaining. Are you sure you don't want a clue? No, no, it's, okay. it's unfair. I've been carried through good fortune, not good fortune, sorry, good charity uh, through this. I will. Sounds like the podcast. <laughs> Yeah. Wait, what? No. <laughs> um, oh, my God. This has been an absolute disaster. I will throw... I will throw... I'm trying to think of a maybe a Premier League team that's, that's gone up. Um, Sheffield United. Sheffield United. Chris Wilder. Correct. Chris Wilder guided them to the title in 2017. They're the sixth most recent. Justin, you've got two remaining. Charles. Charlton. Charlton. Lee Bowyer. No, uh, no, no, Charlton no, no, no. are not correct. They won they the playoffs. Won the playoffs. Yep, you are right. Oh dear, Justin. Oh dear, oh dear. The teams you were looking for. Luton. Yeah. They won it in 2019. And the other team is another Premier League team. Wolves. They won it in 2014 with 103 points. The best points tally in league one history so a bit of a disaster Justin you had two goes at it and you still failed yeah uh, I was incredibly confident going into that one as well that was a sneaky sneaky one um, so yeah I used to be good at these I used to be really good at these when we used to have guests on I used to be fantastic and new listeners will not believe me because they might think I'm an absolute thickhead but I used to be good at these and I, yeah. I, I think anyone who thinks you're a thickhead has no reason to not think that and they're right um, ladies and gentlemen that's been Simon Grace and Take for Late and this has been the Second Tier Podcast we'll be back again on Tuesday because we're doing a special reaction episode to Birmingham v Leicester it's Ragatha Christie Part 2 and uh, I'm all here for it so we'll be talking about that on Tuesday and then on Thursday ladies and gentlemen it's a big episode Justin and I will be revealing our halfway team of the season Yes, it's a big one. So you've got that to look forward to on Thursday. So we look forward to seeing you then as well. This has been the Second Tip Podcast. I've been Ryan Dilks. I've been Justin Peach. And a big thank you for listening.